Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to LIBOR's Wednesday webinar. My name is Marianne Monteleone, Vice President of Professional Development for LIBOR. Today, we have a very special guest, and I should say friend, with us today on a very, very timely topic. Let me formally introduce Linda, and then we'll turn it over to her. Linda Lugo has been in the real estate profession since 1987 as a licensed salesperson and became a broker in 1989. Linda is currently the broker owner of a real estate office in Huntington. She earned her BBA in accounting from Adelphi University in 1980. She has served as the Long Island Board of Realtors president in, 20, in 2007 and in 2012, president of the Multiple Listing Service, and of course, New York State Association of Realtors president. Linda has been on the board of managers for One Key since the inception, and was the chairperson for One Key MLS in 2001 and 2002. She is an instructor for LIBOR, NISAR, and NAR. And without further delay, I turn it over to our friend, Linda Lugo. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Um, I feel ancient with that introduction, <laughs> but thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. And this really is a very timely topic dealing with buyer agency. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna jump in. What I'm asking anyone, if you have any questions along the way, I'm gonna try to stop at different intervals to take questions because I think it's very important we have a complete understanding of buyer agency, especially agency in general. So I'm going to get my screen up and let's talk about buyer representation. I'm going to give you some food for thought today. And most importantly, where are we heading in our industry? There's a lot of disruption right now in the industry. And I think it's really important to have an understanding. So we're not fearful, but we are prepared for the future. So let's start with what's on everyone's mind. And I told Marianne, I had to change these slides this morning because things are changing by the minute. So as you are all aware, and I am not an attorney, so I'm so you just so you know, I'm not an attorney, I'm not giving any legal advice, and I'm not giving any legal ease on these cases, but there are many cases out there right now that are not settled yet. So the first one on the top is no select, which is in the US District Court in Massachusetts. This was against a broker owned MLS. So it's not a realtor owned MLS. Uh, they went after MLS PIN and several brokers. Um, so NAR is not named in this lawsuit. Uh, MLS PIN offered to settle the case for $3 million. And we thought it was heading down that path, except uh, the DOJ, Department of Justice, jumped in and has said to everybody, let's keep everything in abeyance right now. So no outcome on that one. Uh, if you are watching the news or saw the newspaper today, because it did make some of our papers, uh, Sitzer Burnett, this was filed in the U.S. District Court in Missouri. And as of yesterday, in just two and a half hours, they think it was two hours and 28 minutes, the jury came back with a verdict in favor of the plaintiffs. So uh, this was against the National Association of Realtors and several large brokerages. Uh, two of the brokerages on the bottom here, you'll see uh, before the case went into the courts on October 16th, anywhere settled uh, on this case and another case for $83.5 million and Remax settled also for 55 million. So it was the remaining defendants uh, that were found and the jury awarded $1.7 billion. And because the case was, um, they came back and said it was a conspiracy and I'll explain this in a minute, it was a conspiracy that means the award is now three times. So we're looking at a $5 billion award that went to the plaintiffs. So again, this is a, was a class action lawsuit. And the whole preface behind the suit was that because of NAR policies and the brokers that followed the policies in the offering of compensation, the sellers said that they were forced to pay a buyer broker. 
So that's where that case is. Uh, as of uh, late yesterday, NAR has settled, has said, excuse me, has said uh, that they will be um, appealing the decision and we don't know who else will be appealing in there. Uh, but NAR is appealing the decision because they believe that their policies actually are pro-consumer. Uh, moving down to Merle, this case was actually filed before Sitzer and Burnett, or Burnett, but Sitzer and Burnett made it into the courtroom before. This is also another class action suit uh, that NAR is involved in. Uh, that case is supposed to be early 2024. So that's where we are sitting right now with these cases. The Sitzer Burnett attorney, after the decision yesterday, when it was favorable to the plaintiffs, within minutes went and filed this new lawsuit. Now I'm calling it Gibson, Chris, and Minors because those are the lead plaintiffs on the case. It did get filed in the district court in Missouri where the Sitzer Burnett case was held. Uh, so it got filed yesterday. They have named seven defendants, including NAR, and the seven the other six defendants are other large brokerages in the country. So they are now in the courts seeking to be established as a class action lawsuit. So this is going to take this one's going to take time, in my opinion, uh, because the courts have to make a decision on whether this uh, meets the standards of a class action lawsuit. And again, I'm not an attorney, but when you follow these things long enough, you, you kind of learn what's going on. So there's a lot happening out in the industry. And with the appeal on the, uh, the other case, the Sitzer Burnett, it's my understanding that it's going to be years before anything ever comes of these cases. But we have to watch what we're doing and what's happening in the industry and our practices. Now, one thing that I want to point out with these cases, um, Gibson, Chris Miners is in Missouri. Sitzer Burnett, Missouri. The Merle case is in Illinois. The No Select case is in uh, Boston. So where in those states, so Massachusetts. So in those states, if you're working as the listing agent, you're automatically are the agent's is uh, the, excuse me, the seller's agent. So, right, you're representing the seller. In those states, they don't have sub-agency. They only have buyer brokers. So if you're working with the buyer, you're representing the buyer. There's no such thing as a buyer customer. And this is the preface be behind all these cases that the sellers were forced to pay buyer's agents. Here in New York State, we do things a little bit differently. Right? I get asked all the time, Linda, why do we have seller's agent, buyer's agent, broker's agent, dual agent, dual agent with designated agent? And I always say because the Department of State says so, right? They say that we have to offer these different types of agency. So I'm not saying that we are shielded and I'm not saying we can't be a target, but we have an obligation when we sit down with our seller clients and take a listing, we are obligated to explain to them the differences between these categories and what it means for them. So hopefully this just adds an added layer of protection for us here. I'm just going to look to see if there's any quick questions. Um, I'm not seeing anything. It looks like we're good for now, Linda. Okay, great. So if there are any questions, just put them into the Q&A and we'll get to them. So if you know your agency disclosure form, hopefully you flipped it over to the other side and have read all of these categories. And I think we need to make sure that we understand what these all mean. And I know there's a lot of confusion out there in the field as to whom we are representing. And I, hopefully I can clear this up for you today and then we can get into the whole buyer agency representation. So let's start with the seller's agent. And I think this is the easiest one to understand. Okay, so as a listing broker, 
All agents under the broker's license are sub agents to the broker. So if someone takes a listing in your company, you are all automatically agents of the seller. And when the seller hires your company, they have to understand that they are responsible for the actions of the company that they have hired. So if ABC Realty is hired by a seller, then all agents under that broker's license are, are the sub-agents to the broker and the homeowner has liability, as we know, vicarious liability back to that company. So that is the first understanding. And I think we, uh, we get that when we take a listing. You know, we're, we get hired and the seller is responsible for our actions. We have fiduciary duties to them. What this also means, and I'm gonna keep this a little separated, but you have an agreement with the seller for compensation. And you should have company policies in place that specify that when you take a listing and someone else within your company sells that listing, how that commission is going to be broken up. So that is all taken care of through your listing agreement and through your company policies. But now what happens when we're putting a listing out there to the field? So we have cooperating offices. And when we sit down with the seller, we need to explain to them the difference between a seller's agent, a broker's agent, and a buyer's agent. So I'm no longer talking about your company. I'm talking about the other, we're over 45,000 in one key MLS. I'm talking about all of those that are not part of your brokerage company. And when we sit down with the seller, we have an obligation under New York state law, and we have an obligation under article one of the code of ethics that they understand the representation and they understand also compensation. So cooperating brokers, depending on what the seller is agreeable to, can possibly come in as a seller's agent where they are representing the seller. A broker's agent where they are representing the seller through the listing broker, or they can come in as a buyer's agent where they are representing the buyer. The first two categories, these would be buyer customers of that cooperating broker. The last one would be a buyer client. So I just want to go through how this all flows and liability back to your, your seller clients. So let's start with the first one where we are working with a cooperating broker and that cooperating broker is a seller's agent. So on the left side, we have the homeowner who has liability. We have the listing broker who has liability and the cooperating broker and salesperson has liability. So what does that mean? In this scenario, and I, I use this as an example because this happened 20 plus years ago to a broker who I knew, salesperson went, showed a house, there was all wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, and that cooperating agent told the buyer customer that there was hardwood floors under that carpeting. So the buyer is all excited, they buy the house, they closed, and guess what happens once that, once that carpet got ripped up? No hardwood floors. So the buyer, of course, was upset and now filed the lawsuit against the cooperating broker, the listing broker, and the homeowner. And under this scenario, if the cooperating broker goes in as a seller's agent where they have a buyer customer, everyone has liability in this transaction. So the homeowner, who may not even know the cooperating broker, has exposed themselves to vicarious liability. So that's one way a cooperating broker can come in. Next would be a broker's agent. So with a broker's agent, still the cooperating broker is working with a buyer customer. And under that same hardwood floor scenario, in this case, the liability stops with the listing broker. So the buyer has a right to go after the 
cooperating broker and the listing broker. So it does not get the listing broker off the hook at all from a liability standpoint. However, we have now protected our homeowner from vicarious liability with the cooperating brokers. The last way would be when that cooperating broker has a buyer client. Now, whether they're coming in with a written agreement or not a written agreement, we will discuss on how that all could work, but they are coming in representing the buyer. So with that hardwood floor scenario, the liability stops with the buyer agent, buyer broker, and all liability is removed from the listing broker and the homeowner. So now that being said, first of all, are there any questions on this? Because I don't care if you've been a minute in the business or a hundred years in the business, when I teach agency, this tends to be the hardest thing for agents to grab. So I'm just gonna look to see if there's any questions. So there's a question here that says, where will the awarded money go? And I don't know what, what that's referring to. If you want to type something a little more uh, detailed, I'd be happy to answer that question. Uh, but I don't know what awarded money we are talking about. If it's uh, the lawsuit <laughs> that gets won, then it goes to the person who sued us. But um, if you want to explain that question a little further, I'd be happy to answer it. Uh, in the chat, um, I'm going to, we don't have time to go through the agency disclosure form. That is like the whole other hour we would need. Um, so client versus customer. Okay. This goes back to agency 101. A client, we work for a client. We have our fiduciary duties to our clients. Remember old car? that you learned in salesperson or a CC load. So the client we have fiduciary duties to. The customer, we have no re agency relationship with them. There is no fiduciary duty. We still have to be honest with them, uh, but we do not have those, those duties. So that is the difference. So if, it, and it comes down to representation. So in this scenario here, the listing broker has their seller client, the buyer broker has their buyer client, two separate clients, two separate companies. Hopefully that answered your question. Uh, we're gonna get to the compensation. I see some questions about compensation. We're gonna get to that one. Uh, let's see, seller agent with the buyer customer versus broker agent with the buyer customer. Does the seller agent work for the same company as listing agent? Um, I am speaking right now about cooperating brokers. If it's in-house, if it's in-house listing of, you know, of your company, it, it, you're all sellers agents to that seller, always. But cooperating brokers, we're gonna talk about how this works as well. So some of your questions we're gonna get to. So let's take a look. This should look familiar to you. This is the exclusive right to sell agreement that is provided by one key MLS. You obviously can use any of your own agreements. There's no standard forms here in New York, uh, but I'm zeroing in on this compensation field. And as I said earlier, we have an obligation when we're sitting down with our seller client, they have the right to know the difference between a seller's agent, a broker's agent, and a buyer's agent and they also have the right to know after we have an agreed upon compensation amount, whether it's a percentage or a dollar amount, they have the right to know what, if anything, we are willing to share with cooperating brokers. They have the right to know this. And they're the ones, you can see owner initial, that are going to initial this. So it is when you get this form out and you're at this point to discuss the compensation is really the prime time to discuss with them the agents, the different, oops, didn't mean to do that, the different agencies on how cooperating brokers could come in. So if I go down the list of if the cooperating broker is a seller's agent, 
I want to explain that to my seller that if we let seller's agent come in from all of these other companies and they make a mistake, that the seller is open to liability of their actions. I'll move down to the next one. I tell the seller, if we let cooperating brokers come in as broker's agents, which means they are not, they don't have a relationship with the buyer. The buyer is a customer. The first one, seller agent, broker agent, the buyer is a customer. So with the broker's agent, if the agent comes in and makes a mistake, the seller has no liability. And then we explain to them about the buyer's agent and how the buyer's agent, when they come in, may or may not have a contract with their buyer, and the, but they, we are protected from liability. So the first thing we have to speak to the seller about is the liability issue. I would think, and this is Linda's opinion, if we explain the liability of a seller's agent to the homeowner, they're going to say, I don't want any cooperating broker coming in as a seller's agent because I don't want to be responsible for someone I've never met. Now, again, that's my opinion. But the seller will say, well, I don't want to miss out on any buyers. And that's the beauty of what we have here in New York is we can still let cooperating brokers come in as broker's agents where they have buyer customers and we can let them come in. We have to let them come in with uh, if they're representing the buyer as buyer's agents, New York state law says we have to let anyone who's representing the buyer show our properties because the buyer has the right to representation. So once the seller understands how we can cooperate, then we can go to the discussion of compensation. Now, something just recently changed. Uh, it was clarified by the National Association of Realtors. And I will read this to you only because it's too long for me to memorize. Uh, this statement came out a few weeks ago from the National Association of Realtors. Uh, they said NAR's MLS policy requires participants to, to communicate an offer of compensation to other MLS participants. And that offer can be any amount, including $0. NAR is not requiring nor encouraging MLSs to change their data fields to permit zero dollars. NAR has always believed that NAR's MLS guidelines and local broker marketplaces create highly competitive markets, empower small businesses, and ensure equitable home ownership opportunities, superior customer service, and greater cost options for all buyers and sellers. So that is a mouthful, and you can see why I couldn't memorize it. But the point here is that NAR may, came out and made a determination, whether it was based on the lawsuits or not, I don't know, where they said $0 is an offer of compensation. And in the past, some MLSs were requiring at least, and again, this is just for educational purposes, they were saying a minimal of a, a dollar or a penny. But what's the difference between a penny and zero? So because of NAR coming out and saying this, one key MLS made a decision at our last board of managers meeting that zero compensation is acceptable. Now, that's not saying we're saying everybody should run out and do this, right? We have to work in the best interest of our clients and what is the best thing for them. So these decisions still have to come down to when you sit down with a, a seller client uh, and explain to them how we work together, you have to make the decision with them on how, if anything, you're going to offer from $0 up to whatever the case may be. So, um, so that being said, I want to be clear. And the question came up, can you put all zero dollars on this agreement? And the answer is yes. In the past, if they were all zeros, I know these listings were taken down or the broker was called, but zero dollars is an acceptable field because NAR is saying zero dollars is an offer of 
compensation. Now, let's not get ourselves all upset about this. We've got many things here that we want to cover. Uh, I'm just looking to see, uh, just looking at some of these things here. Uh, so on the MLS listing sheet, we put a percentage on seller's agent. Let me, Okay, so there's some things that the difference between, all right, here's questions. What's the difference between a seller agent and a broker agent? Again, they both, in the both cases, or if they have buyers, those buyers are buyer customers. There is no relationship with them as a client. They are a customer. And that means the seller's agent and broker's agent, when they are working, they are working on behalf of the seller. The difference is if it's a seller's agent, the seller has vicarious liability. The seller is responsible for the actions of seller's agents. They are not responsible for the actions of broker agents or buyer agents. So hopefully that cleared that up. Uh, as for the multiple listing sheet, how you fill this out here, again, is between you and your seller client. Uh, if you are a broker, you will make your own decisions for your company. If you're not the broker here, then please have conversations with your broker as to what the best practice, how you want to work for your company, right? We all have maybe different requirements from each other. So I can't tell you how to fill this out. I'm just giving you the breakdown on what these fields mean. And it is our obligation. We should not be just filling out these agreements and putting in you know, a total percentage or dollar amount and then filling it out however we want. The seller has the right to know. And having these discussions with their, your seller and them signing off, it, you wanna make sure it's clear. But especially with all the litigation going on out there, more than ever, it's important to have these conversations. So let me move on. So this is off of two different agreements on the MLS. The top one has a seller agency with a dash through it. And then this one says buyer agency 2%, broker agency comp 2%. Again, I took this off of one key MLS. We're not talking in general terms about anything other than what's in front of you. So in this case, they clearly are saying, putting a dash here, we're not offering even a zero to seller agency compensation. And 2% if you're coming in as a buyer agent, representing the buyer, 2% coming in as a broker agent, if you're representing the seller. The bottom one, this one is all zeros. Zero, zero, zero. And this, again, as I said, is acceptable to put on the multiple listing service. This one here, I would hope that the agent had a very long conversation with the seller and then the, the decision was made from there. So there's no right or wrong here. One thing I'd like to point out, I think we have to start, in my opinion, putting in the percentage and, and the, or the dollar sign in front of these numbers. So it is clear that, you know, if I, if this one just said two and no percentage, uh, is that $2 or is that 2%? So you never want to make any assumptions. So as a listing broker, I would recommend start adding that little dollar sign or percentage. So it is very clear to the field, but either way, these listings are acceptable. Questions. I'm going to just see if there's any questions on this. All right. So, oh, oh, here's a question. And I want this is thank you that somebody said this. I have one here that says the lines on the form we'd be better off as listing agent, buyer's agent, broker's agent. I think we have to go back and I want to clarify this. When we put out these listings, this seller agency compensation field is not the listing broker's compensation. The listing broker's compensation is never published. So 
So I'll go back to this form. This compensation, when you take a listing, you are putting in the total commission, whatever the case may be, either a percentage or a dollar amount. And then of that amount, the next three lines down are what you are willing and the seller has agreed that you will share with cooperating brokers. We never ever publish what the listing broker is getting. So you will never see on the listing, listing broker's compensation. The seller's agent compensation is if we're offering out to cooperating brokers. So please, let's make sure this is understood. The breakdown here is what we are willing to offer to cooperating brokers only. So hopefully that cleared that up. And I appreciate somebody asking that question because uh, others may not get it as well. Uh, there's a question, when would you use a zero commission agreement when there's an agreement between you and your client to do so? And I would hope that would be after you've had a lengthy conversation with the client as to the pros and cons on doing that. Uh, next one, are all sellers agents from the same company as the listing agent and are all brokers agents from a different company and the buyer is a customer? Okay, so I'm gonna take this within the brokerage itself. If you are the listing broker in the listing company, automatically, any buyers that are calling on that listing will be customers unless, unless there's an agreement that they are a client. So when you, if I walk out today and take a, a listing and I get a phone call from a, a buyer who I've never met before, I'm going to explain to that buyer that I'm representing the seller. So my seller is my client, the buyer is the customer. That's how that would work. If it's a buyer I already have as a client, then that's a whole dual agency thing. And I don't want to turn this into a dual agency class here. Um, and then uh, there was something pointed out, just because the listing has three zeros does not mean the seller is opposed to allowing a buyer agent to roll in their commission. Absolutely. Uh, a buyer agent who has an agreement with their buyer and they want to put an offer on the plate with their commission in there, absolutely can do that. So we're gonna talk a little bit more as we're going along here. So please keep in mind, and I've seen this happen. I know that some agents are putting their listing compensation out on MLS. We never publish that, never. So let's move a little further here. Let's go into buyer brokerage. First thing I want to point out is standard operating procedures that are required by New York State Department of State. Your company, your broker has already determined what these standard operating procedures are, and they apply to your entire brokerage. And one of the questions in the SOP is, do you require a written buyer's agreement before you're going to work with a buyer? So the first thing you wanna find out is what are the policies for your company? Everyone may have different policies and that's between you and your broker. But let's move this a little further along and what we really should be thinking about. Let's talk about the value and role of the buyer representative. We're a unique business where my competitors I rely on in, in working together to get property sold. So we're very unique in that nature. And if I am representing the seller, that doesn't mean the buyer representative is my enemy. We have different goals for our clients, but ultimately the goal is if the seller wants to sell and the buyer wants to, to buy, what is it that we need to do to get them to a mutually agreeable position? And for my listing agents out there, we have to keep in mind that when we offer compensation to buyer's agents, doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to accept that compensation or they may have a completely different compensation where they could ask to get paid by both parties. So 
I want to try to keep the agency and the compensation separate. I know they get linked together and tied in, but let's keep in mind agency doesn't necessarily always say who's paying us. So what do buyers get? Let's talk about the buyer. And why do we want to work with buyers and have contracts with buyers? I would say market is shifting. It's going to, it's not shifting quickly, but it's starting to shift. And some of you may not have been in the business long enough. You've only seen a seller's market. But when this market shifts, uh, so will our desire on who we may want to be working with. I know back in 1987, when I got licensed, my broker was like, get listing, get listing, listings are gold, listing are gold. Because back in those days, buyer brokerage was not even talked about, not even a thing here. So yes, you want to go out and get listings because why do we do that? Because we get a client and they agree if we provide a service that they're going to pay us. Well, let's shift this over. I know people here do buyer brokerage and the buyers are gold. They're gold if you can turn them into a client. They're gold, they sign an agreement with you. And what, what, how do we get this? How do we get them to work with us? The same way we get sellers to work with us. You know, they are looking for services, information, and they want guidance. And I learned a long time ago, when I first started in the business, there was no internet. And the fear was when the internet comes, they're not going to need us anymore because all the information is out there. I can tell you they need us more than ever because there is so much information on real estate and our market that they have no clue what they're reading. And we are doing, we're the professionals here. So we need to show that we can provide the services, we can give them the information and help guide them through the process. Um, what are the, they looking for? They're looking for someone who's honest, they're looking for experience and someone with a good reputation. And it's important for us to understand this. And it's the same thing sellers are looking for, right? It's not any different, right? It's whom, who does the, who do they want to work with? Who does the consumer want to work with? So how is the buyer agency relationship formed? Uh, it's built on, it's built on strong first impressions. It's built on trust. They, it's just like with sellers. If you think about what you do with sellers, you can apply it to what we do with buyers. We want to have a productive working relationship and we must have knowledge of the legal aspects of the relationship because this is critical. I think most agents have no problem going in, sitting down with the seller and saying, hey, I, here's the market analysis. This is what I think your home is worth. And you know, these, this is what I can do for you. And please sign up with me. I think that's a very comfortable practice for most of us. But then we have, ooh, the buyer. How are we going to get buyers to sign an agreement? Well, let me say this. Most buyers that are coming from other states are in states where if you're the buyer, your realtor is working for you, you have representation. So most buyers coming here from other parts of the country, other parts of this world are expecting representation. And I think we put it in our heads that buyers are not going to sign contracts with us. On the contrary, if they trust you and they wanna work with you and they believe that you know what you're talking about, they will sign agreements with you. It starts with a counseling session. Now, I, I put up this slide a couple of weeks ago as in Staten Island, and I got laughed at by the second one. It says, your first appointment with the buyer is your counseling session. Great, understood. But when I got to the next one and I said, expect two hours for that first meeting, I almost got laughed off the floor. And quite frankly, I was expecting that. I was really expecting that. And I, you know, I was like, fine. And I turned it around and I said, when you go on a listing appointment for a seller, how long are you there for? And the response overwhelmingly was like, oh, two hours. 
So why would you treat the buyers differently? There's a counseling session. You're there, you want them to sign an agreement with you. You want them to trust you. You want them to understand your services. And, and really it's very important to know what services you have a value proposition. And I can't turn this into a eight hour buyer course, uh, but when I teach the ABR, we go into great details. We all bring things to the table. So you wanna have a counseling session with them, get to know them and get that trust from them. So it's going to make your job easier. And having your knowledge of the laws and regulations and policies is very, very important. I'm just gonna see if there's any questions here. All right, I see one that says, if there is no written agreement between buyer and agent, does that mean the agent is automatically representing the seller? So there is nothing automatic in this business. It will depend on the conversation that you have with your buyer. You may have buyers that you have just met for the first time, and they say to you, yes, I like everything that you're saying. I want you to represent me but I'm not ready to sign that agreement. So to me, that would be an open agreement with the buyer. So you can still represent the buyer, but you don't have that written agreement. I, it's the same thing as those sellers that we call the seller and say, we, you, know, you wanna list with us? And they say, no, I don't wanna list with you, but if you have a buyer for the house, I'll let you show it and I will, pay you for showing it. So it's the same thing as an open listing for a seller. We have open agreements with buyers. That buyer, if you don't have a written agreement, can go out and work with as many other brokers that they want to. And whoever finds the property is the one that's going to get rewarded. It always comes down to why do you want to work that way? If you don't like going working open listings for sellers, you may want to think, do you really want to work an open agreement with the buyer. That would be a question for you and your broker to determine. But you can represent the buyers without an agreement, just like you can represent anyone without a written agreement. But the written agreement is the contract, right? The agency disclosure is not a contract. It says it on the form. It is our obligation to explain whom we are representing with that agency disclosure so it is clear but the contract is the one that really sets the term for the job we're going to do and how we're going to get paid and how much we're going to get paid for doing that job. I'm keeping an eye on the clock here too. So these are the contracts we need to know in this industry, right? On the selling side, we have the listing agreement is between the seller and the listing broker. It creates the relationship and it spells out duties and compensation. Same thing for the buyer representation agreement. It's between the buyer and the brokerage. It creates the relationship and it spells out the duties and compensation. So there is no difference. The difference is that we are so trained in our head uh, not to go after those buyers and get a written agreement. And I'm not saying all of you, because I know some of you do it very well but I think we have to overcome these things. I don't know where the industry is going with all these lawsuits, even though it's gonna take time and flush itself out. Do you really wanna wait for legislation to come out that says uh, sellers are no longer allowed to pay buyers, buyer agents? So I say, get ahead of the curve and get to know this. And if you never wanna be a, representing buyers, Hopefully this will help you as a, make you a stronger listing agent to recognize that the buyers with their agents have the right to come up with their own compensation amongst their own contract. So we have exclusive agreements and we have non-exclusive agreements. So under the exclusive agreement, uh, the brokerage is owed compensation regardless of who buyer purchased property through or from. And again, it all comes down to what's written into the agreement, right? There's certain characteristics of the agreement have to be addressed. On a non-exclusive, you're only going to get paid if you're involved with that buyer finding the property. 
So again, it comes down to how you want to work. I prefer to work with exclusive agreements. I like to have my clients be tied into an agreement with me. I'm going to provide services to them. I'm going to take good care of them. Uh, but I want to know at the end of the day, I do the job, I'm going to get compensated. So what happens when the buyers won't sign? And the recommendation here from me would be, if you haven't taken any buyer agency courses, please take them. You have a deeper understanding of agency to begin with and overcoming objections with getting these agreements signed. So here's some just helpful hints that if you can't get a buyer to sign an agreement, you have that option of going non-exclusive with that open agreement, or maybe you could say to them, give me a week, give me a day, give me three weeks, whatever the case may be, give me a short-term agreement. And then if you like what I'm doing, we can extend the agreement. So food for thought, just to help you get over that initial, like, how do I do this? How can we get compensated? It can be a, a compensate based off the sale price, uh, when they sign the agreement, my buyer clients are responsible to make sure I do get compensated. And it can be payable if the seller or listing broker does not pay. So everything gets spelled out in the agreement. It can be a flat fee. We can take nothing from the listing side. Um, again, flat fee buyer typically pays the brokerage. It could be an hourly rate. There can We can take retainers. So the, the sky is a limit on these agreements on what we can do, of course, within reason. If we want them to sign with us, it has to be mutually agreeable. The agreement will establish a compensation at the time of the agreement. So once that agreement is signed, it's in there. If I do my job, you're going to give me X percent or X dollars. So it's an agreement between myself and my buyer client, and it's not involving the seller or the listing agent. The buyer can pay me at closing. They have the option to ask the seller to pay it. And the you know, buyer must know prior to showing if the compensation does not match. So if I have an agreement with my buyer client and it's not matching up with what I'm being offered from the listing broker, then my buyer client, I, let, I, I inform them. This is what's happening. This is the differential. And this is what's how we're going to work this out. So, but that agreement, I solidified that agreement at the time that they signed it. With no agreement, before you're showing properties, if you're, rep, you know, if they are the buyer, you're representing them through agency and there's no written agreement, you're going to have to let them know what the range of compensation is prior to showing the property. You're going to have to let them know what, what it is that you're going to get paid on every property you're going to show. Um, and then when you're writing the offer, you need to make sure they understand what the actual offer of compensation is, because they're, again, you're, you're representing them, even though they may not be paying you and it's an open agreement, you want to make sure that that's spelled out. And you want to make sure you're showing properties that fit your buyer's needs, not what the compensation is that's being offered. So this is really a strong reason why you should get that written agreement with the buyers, among other things. And we're condensing this really down into, you know, an hour conversation, which this really is about a eight to 16 hour course that we go through. I, I think it's important just to know that you, the industry definitely is changing. We want to be ahead of that curve and, and see where this all goes. I am going to bring up the exclusive agreement in case you've never seen it. All of the forms that are available for buyers and sellers are available on Instanet. It's all part of your MLS package. And all of the forms are there. But I'm not sure how many of you have actually seen the agreement. I'm going to show you the agreement that one key has. Um, oh, before I do that, I missed one. Um, and if there's no written agreement um, and the seller's not going to pay you, so let's say you have no written agreement with the buyer, the seller's not offering you any compensation, um, what are you going to do? You're going to tell the buyer, um, 
should look at the property with somebody else or maybe get that written agreement signed. You know, don't leave yourselves hanging out there in the wind. So here is the exclusive agreement. This, again, there is no standard agreements in New York State. You can use any agreement that you want for buyer representation. I'm not going to go through the whole agreement. I have all of the pages here, but I think the most important thing here is the, the buyer's name and address. The agreement beginning and end, like just like a listing agreement for a house, you have a beginning and end to your agreement and the spelling out of what your obligations are to the buyer. Then we come to the client obligations. What you know, we put in here the buyer client obligations as well, and how we're going to what we're going to get compensated and how we're going to get compensated. And the again, the how long in the event that we have in our agreement, in the event that the buyer after the end of the agreement goes and buys a property that we showed them, how long of a time we might be compensated. So this form protects us with that. The it goes on, of course, fair housing is in there. I find number six is very, very, very important because if you have working with a lot of buyer clients and you might be showing the other buyer clients the same properties, you want it to be understood that they are agreeing to this to happen, right? Now you have a buyer client, you're supposed to work in their best interest. Well, what if you have another buyer client looking at the same property? So you want that protection for yourself as well. Uh, the commission payment, what happens if there's a dispute with the commissions is in there. Uh, the Home Equity Theft Protection Act, Prevention Act is here where the purchase is going to say whether they're going to buy this as their principal, uh, um, principal residence or as an investor. Again, the Home Equity Theft Prevention Act, if you're not familiar with it in New York State, has to do with those um, properties that are in foreclosure and the protection of those who are in a, a weak position and may have equity in their homes that there's where that people are not going in there and trying to swipe away their homes from them. So that's my interpretation of the law. And then um, the very bottom will say what type of properties they're looking for, geographic location. So this really spells out where you're going to be searching for properties for them. Uh, you know, they could be thinking they're going to buy here or they may be buying in New Jersey. You want to set that stage, the what ifs, the what if you don't have, you know, access to some areas out there. So the agreement is all on a legal size document. It is easy to read through. It's not any different than your listing agreement for your sellers. I highly recommend that if you haven't read the agreements you put before any Buddy, that you read them and you understand and you can answer any questions about the agreements. Um, we should be in, you know, embracing what is happening out there in the industry. There have been many changes since I started in 1987. I guarantee there's always going to be changes to our industry. And we want to make sure that you have all the tools that you need out there. Um, going back, before I look to see if there's any more questions, going back, just circling back to that, that compensation that one key allows zero dollars in those fields. Again, please keep in mind, you have to, it's a must have these conversations with your sellers. This is not, for my listing agents out there, a windfall day for you. We have to keep in mind the best interest for our clients and explain to them why we are willing to share compensation. And they are the ultimate decision maker with us to decide how we're going to do that. Sellers want to sell and they, we don't want to be putting obstacles out there. So whatever the agreement is between you and your client is what should be going out on the MLS. Uh, let me... Linda, we had a quick question. I just want to get to before we get too far. Oh, was great. There no, I'm not, I'm not ending. I want to take questions. Oh, no, I um, Someone asked if there's anywhere that we can download those templates we were just looking at. I believe those should be on lirealtor.com. 
So the, there's anywhere um, else that the they buyer, we talk about the buyer representation agreement? Yeah. Okay. So the buyer representation agreement, I am sure, is on lirealtor.com. I use Instanet on Stratus. So if you go into Stratus, you go into the MLS links, you go to Instanet, all the forms are there. All the forms can be filled out. I have the worst handwriting. So I like to go in and type them all up so they look neat and professional. And you can print them, you can email them, you can send them out for electronic signature. Can't make it any easier. Hey, Linda, Great. It's, oh, hi, it, Patrick. Yeah, hey, hey, thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to jump in and I, I'm sorry it was a minute or two late. Um, but to answer, follow up on that question, yes, the form is also available on lirealtor.com and that's the uh, buyer representation agreement. We also put together a buyer representation resources page and this webinar is going to be on there for anybody that missed it, but we've got articles that go over a lot of the things that Linda um, did go over. We have other resources to help you explain um, your value, um, help explain the whole concept of buyer representation, buyer representation agreements, tips on like Linda went through how to effectively get them signed and explain them to your buyer prospects. Um, so that's under member resources. It, we just launched it about a week or two ago uh, and it's buyer representation resources and we're going to continually add to it. Um, so you know anybody who's interested in more should, should definitely go there for a look. Uh, and I think Marianne just put the link into the chat. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I put that in the, the documents on demand page in the chat for people to check out. That That's great. I, I, I think a key takeaway here, please, is if you do not understand agency, if you do not understand seller's agent, broker's agent, buyer agent, dual agent, dual agent with designated agent, please take agency courses sooner than later. Uh, it is the mi most misunderstood concept out there, but it will keep you out of trouble if you understand what you're doing out there. And, and again, I get asked, why do we have this? It's because Department of State says we have to. And until Department of State and our legislation changes, we will continue to see this on the agency disclosure forms. And, you know, protect yourselves out there. And to just add one other thing, because I know you got some questions on dual agency and you said we don't have time for that. And I agree we right can. now, but we have a webinar coming up next week uh, with Neil Garfinkel that is going to focus primarily on dual agency. Um, so you know, if you want to learn more about that, Great. come back next week. And again, that will be if you have to miss it, it's going to get up and we'll put it up on, on the website. Um, and we're going to do another couple. I, I don't know. I don't want to give names yet because I'm not sure if they're totally nailed down, but we're going to do a few more this month on buyer representation, uh, buyer agency specific. So um, I, I know there are still some other questions that were in there that maybe we didn't get to, but we're going to package as much as we can. And then beyond that, everyone, like Linda said, some of these, these courses are, are, you know, one, two, three day courses you, you need if to really protect yourself and understand, go take the courses. Uh, because that's that's the only way to learn it all um, in, in terms of, of, of being as competent and capable as someone like Linda. You can all do it, uh, but you have to take the courses and you have to learn it. Yeah, it, it's a matter of comfort. You know, the more you learn and the more comfortable you get, then the better you get at everything, too. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm willing to I'm happy to take any more questions unless we are done. I, you tell me, Patrick, if there, I don't know if there's any other questions here. Um, I know you're going to cover dual agency at another time. Yeah, we are going to cover dual agency. We are going to have another program on buyer representation. Um, I mean, I, I, I know there were some things in the chat that were more comments than questions. Um, and I, I know we're basically at the hour at this point. Okay. So I would say if people have more questions, come back to the other um, webinars we're running. And if you still have questions beyond that that aren't answered, then sign up for some of the courses. We even put um, listings for, uh, you know, ways to access some of the courses that are being offered right now. And I know, um, we're looking to put together more, um, going into the future. Well, I want to just say thank you to Patrick and Marianne for inviting me to speak here. It's a passionate subject for me. And I, you know, I appreciate that. And, um, I, you know, I wish everybody best in the field. Just know that LIBOR, one key, they have their finger on the pulse. We know what's going on at the industry. We're watching it closely. 
And as things happen, you're, you're going to know what's going on. Yeah, it's just stay tuned. I mean, that's really the, the key right now. I mean, I know everybody saw the news about the result of the, of the verdict that was issued yesterday. Um, there's a, still a lot we don't know, but as soon as we know more and can communicate more and have more information, we're going to be your resource. We want to help everybody out there um, get through any changes that may take place in the industry. Terrific. Well, I thank everyone for being here. And I'm not running this show. Patrick, you are. So you tell no, me. No, I, I think Marianne <laughs> or Ethan are. So thank you, everybody. We'll hopefully we'll see everybody next week. That this was really great, exactly what we wanted. So thank you, Linda. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, Patrick. Stay well, everyone. <laughs>